I turn with me this morning, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 this morning. We began last week uh, this series that we're looking at through the summer called Bless This Home. Uh, what does it mean to have a blessed home, a blessed marriage, a blessed, uh, a blessed in raising kids, blessed grandchildren? Um, if you're single, how do you have a blessed home in, a, in singlehood? We're looking at this idea of how we can find God's blessing in our homes. Let me say this, as last week we looked at, I believe the pinnacle and the heart of this whole series which is, without Christ, there is no blessing. There's no blessing in life. There's no goodness in life. That Christ has to be the centerpiece of our homes. If you remember, we looked at last week the passage in Ephesians chapter 5, where it beautifully speaks of husbands, wives, and children. Um, and it says, wives, submit to your husbands, as the Lord. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ. Love the church. It says, children, obey your parents. And then it says, in the Lord. It says, submitting to one another in reverence to God. That the whole focus of the family dynamic, husband, wife, kids, uh, even singleness. We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that says, uh, dedicate yourself, be devoted to the things of the Lord. It all stems from the Lord. It all stems from the Lord and is all about the Lord. If you want to have blessing in your home, it has to be that the Christ is the centerpiece of your family. Without it, uh, you can expect no blessing. Uh, it would be kind of weird to think that you can have a blessed home and not have the one who brings blessing into life be at the center of it. So we talked about this idea of making Christ the centerpiece of why we do what we do, why we love our wives, why, we, why wives submit to their husbands, why... Uh, why kids obey, why people remain faithful to God in singleness um, as God has them, and it's because of him. It's centerpiece on him. It was interesting, uh, reading an article that was a transcript of a radio program um, with Dr. Howard Hendricks. You may have heard of Dr. Howard Hendricks. He's a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he's a well-known author. And years ago, there was a question that was asked of him on a radio program, and the question was this. What's the secret to family success? Hey, here's a man that's been, that w was married at the time for uh, 60 years to his wife, I believe it was. And he had kids and grandkids, and they were all following Christ. And so they asked him, what is the secret? And he said this. Very interesting. The host said he reached up to the microphone and very quietly spoke these words. He said, I have but two commitments that I focus on. He said that I... And he talked about his wife, his, her name was Jean. Jean and I have two unconditional commitments. We are unconditionally committed to Christ as Lord. Meaning Christ is the Lord of all of our lives. And we are unconditionally committed to help each other make him Lord. Isn't that powerful? I mean, you want the essence of a blessed home? It is that we are unconditionally committed that Christ is the Lord of all that we do and that we are unconditionally committed to help each other be unconditionally committed to Him. That's what we talked about last week, this unconditional commitment that you and I need to have for the Lord. And if you do, then everything else flows from that. Our family flows from that. Our kids flow from that. Raising, being single in a, in a world that screams a relationship and doing it well stems from that commitment to the Lord. Now, this morning, we're going to kind of piggyback that and talk about relationships and family. And kind of the next few weeks, we're going to get really deep and really not, maybe, maybe even a little bit dark as we talk about what this looks like. Um, I remember as a kid, one of the things I looked, looked forward to as a kid, um, and I don't know about you, but I look forward to it even now. How many of you are planning to go on vacation soon? How many of you have already went on vacation? Well, wow. okay, so I don't know why. Maybe you guys aren't excited about it. I don't know. I know there are some that are even watching right now that are on vacation. There are quite a few people that are on vacation. They were saying, hey, we're going to try to watch it on, online and stuff. So uh, there's vacations, right? I don't know about you, but I love like vacations. I don't know about you. 
I don't know how you feel, but like, I needed a vacation yesterday. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I needed a vacation like weeks ago, and we, we have uh, planned our vacation for September, and I hate it. And the reason I hate it is because I feel like I'm waiting, 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 anticipating, waiting, and, and we're looking forward to that. We're talking about our plans for that. Um, and one of the, one of the great um, memories I have as a kid is that we would every year, the entire family, aunts, uncles, my sisters, their, all the kids, cousins, we would go on vacation. We would go to Ocean City, and they would have this condo. My aunt would get this condo, and it would be like a condo that sleeps eight, and there would be 30 people living there. And we would load in, we would pack in. Now, as a kid, I didn't realize, if I had known that they were doing something illegal, but it pretty much was illegal, they were packing as many people, and we were like, hey, you're going to sleep on the kitchen table today. We had no room. And that's where, I mean, as kids, we didn't care. We were at the beach. I loved it. But it never failed before we would go on vacation. The anticipation was so overwhelming. The expectations were so high that I would almost every single time get sick. All right, mom? I would get sick. I remember driving to the beach, Ocean City together, throwing up in the car, waiting to get there. As soon as I got there, healed. Why? My expectations were so high. The anticipation was so high. And finally, it was there. Some of you, right, you're looking forward to vacation. You got plans. You've put all the prep in. You're ready to go. Some of you maybe just got back. I bet you if you just got back from vacation, this is absolutely true. This is absolutely true. You had probably these great expectations of what vacation was going to be like, and the reality is your experience probably didn't match your expectation. Am I right? I mean, you pack up, you low with excitement, and then something happens along the way that just changes the course of the, the, the vacation. Now, I know we, none of us would say our vacation was bad, but I don't know if I've ever had a vacation that actually fulfilled the expectation I had dreamed of in my, my mind. It, it never does. It always lacks something, or something happens that creates it, and it, it makes a good memory down the road, but it didn't make it a good memory at the time. Uh, like maybe you had that happen where you're getting ready to go on vacation, and all of a sudden you're on the way, and there's a flat tire. Or you lose your luggage, or you forget luggage, and you're three hours away. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you know, you're heading to paradise. I know last year this happened to me. We went on vacation, and we got away. And I got there, and the day I got there, I got absolutely sick. Like, my stomach was sick. I had this head, so I had a high fever. And so I'm sitting there, like, suffering, trying to walk out to the beach with the kids, and they were going to the pool, and I was just dead to the world. I was slept, like, most of the time. I was just sick as a dog on vacation. I mean, it was like a blur. There was no vacation. The expectations were high. I packed the car, ready to roll. And if you, you, know, if you, if you go on vacation with me, I don't sit still. I mean, I, I act the way I talk. I'm moving constantly. So when we go on vacation, I'm like, what are we doing next? What are we doing? I don't need the kids to ask that. I ask that. What are we going to do next? Let's go. And, and there I was sick. And it, it was like, it, I look back and it did not match my expectation. Isn't that the way life is? Isn't that the way family is sometimes? Isn't, the, isn't it the unseen reality? Isn't it the... Uh, the the unspoken existence that we have expectations that are not fulfilled in our experiences? Doesn't there seem at time to be a gap between our expectations and our experiences? In fact, there's an author that wrote a book called The Expectation Gap, talking about this gap between our expectation and our experiences. If we're being honest, every single relationship we have has expectations. Every relationship, there are expectations. Like, for example, if you have a job, you have an expectation, right? You're, you're showing up at a certain time, you're working a certain amount of hours, and there is the expectation that your boss has that you're going to do that. I mean, can you imagine walking in and being like, hey, I'm not doing this today. And what would your boss say to you? You're fired. You're not getting paid. I'm not going to pay you to do what... Right? I'm paying you for something. There's an expectation that you have. Can you imagine working for 50 hours, going into your boss, and your boss saying, listen, I'm not going to pay you this week. Just dedicate your 50 hours to the, to the business. You'd be like, I'm quitting, but I'm beating you up first. I mean, that's right. <laughs> I'm taking you out. Right? That would be what is an expectation. By the way, you walk into the bank. There's an expectation, is there not? You walk into the bank. The expectation is when you take your check to get deposited, 
The banker is going to take that money and put it into your account that you write on your deposit slip. Now, imagine if you walk in there and they say, listen, fill out the deposit slip, we're going to cash your check and we're going to use that for our business party later on. Um, is that all right with you? I mean, we're going to do this. Uh, no. <laughs> the expectation is it will be in the bank account. There, is, there are expectations. You, you go work out at Planet Fitness, there is an expectation. You don't walk into Planet Fitness and there's a table of donuts as you walk in. Now, let me just say how cool that would be. They do that? Uh, but, so, wow. Okay, ne never mind. Well, I need to go there. See, more people need to join Planet Fitness. That's a little commercial. But can you imagine? Because the expectation is you're going to go there to get healthy, to lose weight, to, to do something, right, to work out. That's the expectation. We all have expectations, we have expectations as we drive in the car. We have expectations in the classroom. We have ex expectations of the church, of our work. I mean, you go to a supermarket, there's an expectation there's going to be groceries to buy. You go to a pharmacy, there's an expectation that there's going to be medicine you need. There's expectations. Every relationship we have on this earth has expectations. So do our marriages, and so do our parents and parenthood. So do our lives. Now, Many of us live with these expectations, and we would say there is a huge gap between our expectations and what we actually experience, that there is something that is missing. There is frustration that is built because clearly what I expected is not always reality. In fact, most of the time it's not. I'm using kind of the analogy of the seesaw. And when I think about the seesaw, I think about a lot of us are living our lives kind of like this. Like we're trying to match our expectations with our experiences. We're trying to get the experience. But it seems like the more we expect, we're not seeing the experience fulfill that. Um, marriage is the same way, right? We probably all went in. When we, when we had that moment of our wives walk the aisle to commit their lives to us and us to them, we had an expectation, didn't we? We had a dream, a dream of what it would look like. We had a dream of what it would be like to have a child. Like I had this dream of, you know, holding the baby. I love that, right? Having a, having a child, love that. No, no greater joy, having a baby. But I did not think about diapers. I did not think about crying all night. That was not in my expectation. The experience was not like my expectation. I pictured them like, you know, father, yes, father. Uh, you know, my wife, right? My wife, beautiful. She walked the aisle. I remember breaking down as she came down the aisle as we were getting married. There was an expectation, right? I learned. I, I got married at 19 years old. I was turning 20. The reason I got married so young, I couldn't wait any longer. I, I couldn't wait any longer, and we decided marriage was the right answer, and our parents blessed that and said, go ahead. And I'm just being honest, and, and we got married. And, but I know we'll forget. This is a true story, by the way. Um, she walked the aisle. We said our vows. I had a, a little bit of a one-track mind in that moment, right? I've, I waited for her. I wanted to be with her. And, um, I'm talking about intimately. I'm just being honest. And, and you know what happened? This is absolutely true. Um, we get in the car to go away. In fact, we, we got married in the D.C. area, and I actually took her. Uh, we went to the Bavarian Inn in Shepherdstown, beautiful place. Um, and we stayed, got the honeymoon suite and stayed there. And uh, we were driving, and she's, as we were driving, she says, Dave, I just had this horrible headache, horrible headache. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a new husband. I'm like, babe, you just lay, lay, lay your head back. And she wore this big old veil. And you know, you know how weddings are all day. It's exhausting. So he had this headache. And I was like, you just, you lay back. I'll drive up there. I drove up in silence. Uh, I, I turned on a little bit of music just so I could have some noise. And she slept the entire way. So we get to the place. I'm like, hey, she's going to rest. She's going to be good to go after we get, you know, <laughs> this is, this is the honeymoon. I'm not lying. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Let's be honest about this. And so and so we get there, um, and she gets inside of this place, and, and a beautiful room, and she says, Dave, I'm just going to, uh, if you, you want to get the luggage, I'm just going to lay my head down for a few moments. I just got this sickening headache. I mean, like it was, she was nauseating. And this is no lie, expectations. I, she lays down. I said, babe, lay down. Because I'm a new husband, so I'm like, babe, you don't want me to carry you in? You want me to, oh, let me, can I get you a warm cloth, a cold cloth? Do you need anything? Here, you just lay right here. You just take it easy. I'm going to get all the luggage. I'll get them all in, get everything put away. We'll be ready to roll. So I go outside. I get the luggage. I bring it in. And she is out cold. <laughs> out cold. This is our honeymoon, all right? And so I don't know what to do. Do I wake her up? Because there's expectations. 
And so I lay there beside her on the bed, and she is out cold. And it was two hours later, and she woke up, something like that. And I remember thinking, as I was laying there staring at the ceiling, she tells the story that when she woke up, she looked over, and I was just staring at the ceiling. (laughs) And my thought was, is this what marriage is all about? (laughs) This is what I committed to? My expectation did not match my experience. Now, everything was all right. We look back and laugh about it now, but in that moment, <laughs> there was just a wee bit of frustration, just a wee bit, but everything worked out fine. We, we, we crack up about that now. Isn't it true, though? Isn't it so true in our lives? And we find ourselves on the seesaw. Now, this can happen in every area of our life that our experience seemed to contradict our expectation. I mean, you could be here this morning, and there's been somebody that you loved that, that, that maybe had an issue in their life, and you prayed for them and prayed for them, prayed for them, prayed that God would heal them. You even quoted scripture like, God, you said if we ask, you can do it, and it didn't happen. Our expectation was that God was going to heal, but our experience said he didn't. It could have been a job situation where you knew that if you could just get this job, it would change your life financially. It would help your life financially. It would guide you in the right direction. It would be something that you would love to do. And so you even came to God and said, God, I I really need this. This would really be a big help. And something happens and your experience does not match the expectation that you had for your job. I mean, it, it could be that you had somebody in your life, maybe a parent, maybe a grandparent, maybe, maybe even a, a spouse that, that you thought was going to protect you and guard you and provide for you, and they did just the exact opposite, and your experience was so far away from your expectation when it originally started. For you, maybe it was a, a, a situation in your family. Maybe it was kids that have rebelled against God, and you thought, well, listen, if I just pray for them, and I teach them, and I try to live this out, they would follow Christ, and now they've rebelled against Him. And here you are saying, listen, I had an expectation, but my experience is very, very different than my expectation. And the response most of us have, if we're being very honest in the midst of this frustration, if we're being honest, there is a myriad of, of, of emotions we could have when our ex- expectations are not met, when our, when, when our experiences don't match our expectations. There are a myriad of emotions. First of all, for some, they get angry. Folks, a lot of families are living unmet expectations. And there's anger, there's frustration. It, it plays itself out in anger. On the other side of that coin, it may not be anger, it may be sadness. Because there's loss. There's, there's not an expectation that is met, and so there seems to be this gap, and it just creates sadness. For you, maybe it's anxiety. For, on the other side of this coin is anxiety, where you're anxious about the things of life, and, and you're like trying to figure it out and wonder what went wrong, and how can I fix it, and how can this work, and how is this going to be solved? Is it ever going to change? And there's anxiety over that. It, it, can, it can lead to shame, where you think, maybe I've done something that has caused the expectation not to be the experience. It could be that you feel the shame that you've caused it to happen. It could be something that happened in the past, and you've caused this expectation loss, so to speak, this expectation to fail. Maybe there's shame involved in that. And that's where many people, if I'm being honest, when I think of the homes in our country, most people are living with those emotions. There's deep frustration and anger, anxiety, sadness, and shame. And you know what the instinct humanly to do is? Here's the instinct. The instinct that you and I have humanly, and then we're going to look at the right way to handle this. The instinct is to take the expectations and to lower our expectations. To say, you know what, if, if my expectations can't be met, if I had this dream of what my marriage would be like, and I had this dream of what my family would be like, and it's not going to happen this way, my job could be like, I'm going to lower the expectations, and then hopefully I can get an experience that I enjoy. At least something little, something small. Folks, I don't know if that's a biblical idea or not. Now, I think we have to, we're going to talk about how we evaluate our expectations just a little bit. Uh, but I don't think God wants us to lower our expectations of what we would dream in some ways. When I say dream, I don't mean like this picture perfect thing because we, we've already confessed that we're sinners. But I, I, th- I don't think God wants us to lower the expectations we might have for what we want our marriages and our families to look like. I don't, because Jesus said this. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and give it to you how? Abundantly. So 
Clearly, the idea is not that we lower, just lower the bar of expectations. Um, now, there may be a case where we have to lower the bar. It may be in our relationships we have the bar set too high. But I don't think it's just that we need to lower expectations. That's the way we live. Because I'm going to tell you what happens when we do that. And this is where many people find themselves because this is the human reaction. It's when we lower our expectation level to get an experience. Here's what happens. We end up living hopeless lives. We end up living, th- we say things like this. We say things like, well, this was never meant to be this way, but it's just the way it is. And nothing can ever change then. I heard a, uh, a couple recently, I was meeting with them and they said these words. They said, you know, we kind of just hope for the best, but we expect the worst. Anybody want to be married to that? Anybody want to be married to someone who says, I hope for the best, but I'm expecting the worst? How draining is that? Yet many of us are living our lives with this type of mentality. I, I, well, I hope for the best, but my expectations are just going to, it's not going to work. It's not very good. It's going to be miserable. And so I expect it that way. I hope it was different, but I'm expecting it that way. And that's where most people live. I hope for the best, but I expect for the worst. And then we're like, oh, why me? Why does this happen to me? Why doesn't anything go my way? Why doesn't it, right? And we, what we end up doing is complaining about it because we don't like it. Now, here's what's, what's, what's amazing about that. It's because the expectation is still in us. We still have the expectation. Even if you lower it, you still have it. And so it still doesn't get met. And what happens is then we find ourselves overwhelmed in it. And let me just tell you, let me be real with you for a moment. What I see in families and in relationships is we eventually get exactly what we're looking for. You get exactly what you're looking for. I mean, right, I I can look at situations in my family life and I can say, I can see things that are very frustrating and and they can cause even me to feel anger or shame or whatever. I can see them in my family. If I choose to just look at them, if I looked at only those circumstances, if I lower that bar and that's what I look at, I eventually see exactly, right? My wife can do the same. If she looked at it that way, you could see the negative. You can see what's happening. You get what you see. Like you want to see just, well, I'm not talking about positive and negative, but it is kind of that way. You see, you want the negative, you see the negative, right? That's what you're looking for. You're going to see it. Same way in marriage, right? If, if, I, if my wife holds me under a microscope, or I hold her under a microscope, that's what I'm fine. I'm going to find the weaknesses. I'm going to find the struggles. I'm going to find the areas that maybe I don't feel fulfilled. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to be able to use that then against her. I'm going to complain about it. I'm going to then use it against her because the ex- expectation is not fulfilling my, ex- my experience. My experience is, is contradicting the expectation. I mean, right, I, I could have there on a honeymoon night taken the microscope and been like, this is our honeymoon night. I'm never kissing you again. Now, how ridiculous would that be? But isn't that what we kind of do? Uh, isn't that what we, what we do is we lower the expectation, we, we, then we end up finding the negative. We find what is shameful, and we end up living hopeless lives. Now, before we go any further, I find this interesting because many of us in our human relationships have high expectations, right? Like we have high expectations for our marriages. We have high expectations for our bosses. We have high expectations for our churches. We have high expectations for for our families. However, we have low expectations for our kids. I find it interesting that we almost get it opposite where we have these low expectations where we actually have lowered the bar so low for our kids that they, I mean, we don't expect much from them. So we celebrate if they can just wake up on their own in the morning. Woohoo! We celebrate if they get themselves dressed and they're 15 years old. I hear this from parents all the time. Well, hey, at least my kids don't drink, don't chew, and don't go out with the girls that do. Ooh, as if that's the bar of expectation for them. Right, do you, and I, I tell my kids this all the time. I said, no, I have a high expectation for you. We ought to raise the bar of expectation on our kids. Do you realize that it used to be just centuries ago that people were married at 12 and 13 years old? Now, please know, I don't, I'm not trying to marry off my two oldest sons because they're 13 and 14 years old. Don't think about it yet, all right? They're, they're, but... Do you, do you realize that George Washington, I mean, we're talking about just 200 years ago, George Washington was the governor of the not yet colony, Virginia. He was, he was chosen to be the governor at the age of 15. Anybody here on the ballot to be a governor of a state? Now, it wasn't quite the state yet. Nonetheless, it was Virginia before it was Virginia at the age of 15. It was, it was called Virginia, but it was kind of more of a commonwealth, not yet a colony, not yet a state. Um, and he was the governor at the age of 15. 
We see we lower the bar of expectations on our kids when we should be raising the bar of expectations when we should have a realistic expectations with our spouses and with the others in our lives. We actually kind of get this backwards. We lower on our kids. We raise it too high. This is the, the picture. And what we end up having is the seesaw effect where we're trying to get the experience and we're trying to get the expectations and we're trying to balance these things out. And it just doesn't work. And what it leads to is frustration, anger, anxiety, sadness, or shame. Now, as we dive into 1 Peter, I want to tell you what I believe two of the problems are. Just very quickly, and then we're going to look at the answer. First of all, I believe that we as people don't want to mess. We don't want to mess up the dream of marriage and family. Like We don't want to mess up the dream that we had years ago of marriage and family. Like, you know, you might be here and maybe you knew you came to Christ before you got married and you had a dream that you were going to have family devotions together. And that was your vision, your dream. And we don't want to mess that up because we still think it's worth something. We still think it's worth something. But here's the problem. We're not doing anything to change us to fulfill what we've dreamed about. It, it's kind of like this. You know what ends up happening is we, w- our expectations look like this and that's not reality. And so we're frustrated because we're never hitting the experience and so what, what ends up happening is we lower the expectations or we have to change the way we view expectations. But what ends up happening, without even realizing it, is it's almost like eating a meal we know we're going to get sick on later. You know what I mean? Uh, like, um, I, I, I like the Chinese buffet. You like that place? That's good, good stuff. And you go in there, you get some sushi, you have, you have the Mongolian grill on top of all the other stuff you can take. I love those little, those little crab things that they, they kind of bread it. They're fried, I think. I mean, I can get four of those things, get some sushi. That's, that's a good place. But I'm going to tell you, without hesitation, that's going to mess me up later. And I don't have to explain any more of that. It messes with me. I mean, you go to your favorite, you might have a great restaurant you like, and, and you'll go there, right? You'll still eat it, even though you know it's going to mess you up, even though you know it's going to lead to that frustration. You'll still do it. Why? Because you enjoy it taken in. This is the same way many of us view um, our families. We know, we know, we enjoy this dream, even though we know it's not going to be kept. It's, it's leading to frustration. So we ought to reconsider what's realistic in the way of our expectations. But we'll continue to go down the same road and continue to get the same sickness because we we like what what it is and so we we enter marriage with that right we have this premarital romance that you know i I had this you know had this image that it's going to be like my wife and i in the kitchen at all times you know baby love i I had this image of me reading her poetry all the time and her being like dave you are so just manly and right that's what i imaged that was my image right it's not like that it's not like that now there are times like that but it's not normally like that, right? I mean, there, there's this image that the kids are going to be like, yes, Father, whatever you say, Father, we honor you and respect you with everything that we have. Um, doesn't happen, does it? Um, it, it and, and if it does, I celebrate that. We call that a holiday, but um, they don't do that. Why? Because it's not, my, my expectations are this dreamy world that I don't want to give up but it's not reality, and this could be for you as well. I mean, where, it could be where you were going to live and what you're going to be doing, and it could be the, the transportation and finances of your life. You thought you'd be a better situation than you are now, and all these things happen in our lives, and what happens is we have these, these dreams of marriage and family, and we don't, see, we don't see our lives match that. Secondly, let me tell you the second thing that I think is a hang-up and is a source as Christians as to why we, don't, why we have struggles with expectations. I believe it's because of the way that we use Scripture. Let me tell you what I mean by that, and then we're going to show, I'll show you what I mean. I think what we tend to do when we talk about marriage and family is we treat the Bible like it's Wikipedia. We treat the Bible like it's an encyclopedia, and so I, 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 when I want to look at marriage and family and expectations, I go to the back and I say, marriage, family, and expectations. Okay, it's found in this passage. And I go there, and I read Ephesians 5, and I'll say, okay, husbands love your wives, wives love your... Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. And I don't see that what's preceding it is I need to be filled with the Spirit. I don't see that. And so what I do is I read in and I look at the Bible almost like an encyclopedia. The failure is we don't see that the Bible is giving us how to live in every aspect of our lives. 
That means there are passages that apply not only to my spiritual life, but also right into my home. And what we do is we disconnect them. Well, this isn't talking about family, so therefore it doesn't matter about my family. No, it actually does. And that's the problem, which we disconnected. We made the Bible like a Wikipedia or an encyclopedia instead of it being all relevant to every area of my life. When Jesus speaks of dying to myself and taking on my cross, it might be in my marriage. He's talking about that. When, it, when he speaks of, of, of loving him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving my neighbor, my neighbor might be my kids. See, we don't apply that that way. We, we take it and look at the, well, this is about family. Let's read that. No, it's all related to every area of my life. So take a look here, First Peter. I want to give us the answer that I think biblically speaks about expectations. And, and I really do. I think this is our response is the way expectations. And what I'm going to do, we're going to look at this passage and we're going to make question and give a statement with each one and hopefully bring this back to our lives and apply it. First uh, Peter chapter 3 begins like this. Likewise, Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, by the way, the word subject, submission is not a bad word, it is becoming a bad word in our culture, it is a beautiful word, meaning to relinquish your right for the good of another, it's synonymous with love, same word, uh, very, not same word, it's a synonymous word, that means, don't, don't think of this as a sexist statement as our culture looks at it, it is a beautiful word, um, and synonymous with love. Be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. By the way, remember, remember last week we talked about how in Genesis it says one of the aspects of the fall is that wives, you're going to want to be against your husband. You're going to want to rule over him, yet he's going to have authority as a leader of the home. This is the battle, right? The battlegrounds. And so Paul says, uh, Peter here writes in 1 Peter, listen, just as much time as you spend making yourself beautiful on the outside, Make sure you focus on a gentle and quiet spirit toward your husband. That's what it says, right? Now, there are some groups that take these verses and kind of rearrange them. They, they, they look at verse, verse 3 and they said, Don't let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, uh, the, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. And, and there are some that will say, Hey, you shouldn't braid your hair. Uh, you shouldn't wear jewelry. And they'll take this and run with it and make a whole entire almost cult out of it. By the way, I always find it interesting because notice there are three statements here. Don't braid your hair. Don't wear jewelry. And what will the third statement say? Don't wear clothes. <laughs> I mean, if you read that, if you're going to take it, take it literal then. I mean, right? If you're going to teach, don't braid your hair, don't wear jewelry, you better teach don't wear your clothes because that's what it says. That's not his point. His point isn't about braiding your hair or wearing jewelry. His point here is, listen, just as much as you take care of your external, you better not braid your hair but not care about your spirit. You better not put on jewelry and not care about your gentleness. Like you can doll yourself up, but the question is, do you have a gentle and quiet spirit to your husband? That's his point here. He's contrasting the external with the internal. And he says what really matters is internal. Now, uh, this is beautiful when you think about it. And by the way, women, this is, I would encourage you to ask your wives if you're married. If you're single, I would encourage you to ask your future spouse this when you possibly you get married. Your husband, I believe most husbands would agree, they would rather have a woman who respects them than just a woman who is absolutely drop-dead attractive. Because we see how that works. Look at Hollywood. The most beautiful people in the world do not make it. So it's not just about, there is something about an inner beauty of a woman that I, I believe any, especially Christian men, would admit they would much rather have. I would encourage you to ask your husband that. Hey, would you rather me just be beautiful and doll up, or would you rather me have a quiet... And, he, and he's probably going to say, I like both. <laughs> I mean, but what matters to God is the internal beauty, right? By the way, I love what it says next, verse 5. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I've read that to my wife and said, do you notice... Uh, it says, as Sarah called Abraham Lord, we should try to in input this into our marriages, uh, marriage. And yeah, her reaction was, <laughs> like that. No, I'm just kidding. But we talked about it. His point here is, listen, 
there was respect. And that was a cultural thing in that day where they would call Lord, Master, Sir. It was kind of like that was the word. By the way, the word in Hebrew that was seen in Genesis is the word Adonai. Adonai means Lord, Master, Sir. It can be attributed to God, but also to people. And so wives would say Adonai to their husbands. It would be like Sir, Master. Um, and, and that's not derogatory. That was beautiful. It was submissive. Now, notice he goes on, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, some of you husbands probably just went like, <laughs> you're right. I can't understand her. I don't know what she's thinking. I mean, you ever try to understand your wife? It's, it, I mean, am I right? Women, sometimes you can be all over the map a little bit, and, and, and it's hard to figure out. It's like... You're right. This is what he says. But, but notice, by the way, I love the fact that it's a continual active here. It's the idea that you continually have to learn. Literally, this says, if you want to translate this from perfectly from Greek to English, it would say, husbands, live you with your wives as a student learning. That's really what it says in an understanding way that I'm constantly learning how to love my wife, how to lead my wife, how to treat my wife. How, what, what, is, what does she need in, in me and, and through me? Notice it says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That word weaker vessel is where we get our word porcelain. It's the word porcelain here, which, by the way, in their culture was very expensive. It was one of the most expensive pieces you could get today. We kind of throw porcelain around like it's nothing, but porcelain was very expensive in their day, and it was looked at as the most treasured possessions would be put into a porcelain pot. Treat your wives like a weaker vessel as porcelain since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I've preached on this passage before. Um, and he says, husbands, listen, treat your wife like she is the precious pot, uh, the, the, the most valuable possession of your life. Um, and I love, you know, I remember hearing this once, and I always remember this, that husbands, we, we get the privilege of unwrapping the gift of our wives for the rest of our lives. That there is a gift that keeps unwrapping with her, that I get to know her every day, new and refreshing, and I get to know who, what, what she's about and who she is. And that's the beauty of this text, as she is a porcelain pot. That's the beauty of this. Now, we read this and we all agree it's scripture, we believe it. All right, that's the family passage. Husbands love your wives, right? We got Ephesians 5, kids, obey your parents. We got all of it. But it doesn't always happen, does it? It doesn't happen this way all the time. It should, but it doesn't always happen. And we know why, because there are two sinners and multiple sinners living together. It makes this very difficult like usually what happens is one gets it right, but the other doesn't, or one is, the other one's getting right and the other one isn't. Right? There's always seems to be the seesaw effect where one has expectations and the, the experience doesn't show that. The other one has low expectations and the experience is fulfilling that. So there's this constant seesaw effect that is happening. I find it interesting that what we don't do is read the next verses, which I think give us the answer. And I want to focus there for a few moments. Notice verse 8. He says, finally, all of you, who's he talking about? Husbands. Wives, kids, those who are single, everyone, here's what he says. And I think it's still flowing, even though he says the word finally, he's, he's bringing this out, and I think it still flows from what he said just in the previous verses. He says, finally, do this, finally. All of you have unity of mind. Now, what we're going to read here is going to give us how we do what we've just read. Like, how do we accomplish that? Our expectations, our, our experiences do not match our expectations. So how do we do this? What does this look like to live? I think he's giving us the answer right here in the, the following verses. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. The word here uh, is the word homophrones in, in Greek. It's where we get our word harmony from. Not e-harmony, harmony. Harmony, which is... If I'm being honest with this, if we're being honest this morning, is it, isn't this what we want? This. This worked really well. Then. There you go. Don't we want our expectations to match our experiences? This is not what we really want. Is we, we, we want our expectations to be met. We want our experiences to to not contradict our expectations. Well, he says here, first of all, we have to be of the same mind. We have to be in harmony, balance, together. We have to understand each other. So, so that means I have to understand, first of all, because of last week, 
what we looked at, I have to understand what God expects of me and what God expects of my wife, what God expects of my kids. I have to build a biblical foundation for what I'm expected to do. So the question I ask, and again, we're going to ask the question to make a statement. Are we of the same mind about what are God's expectations for me? Am I of the same mind with my wife about what God is expecting of us? That means I have to have a conversation with her. You know what I find number one problem with expectations are? Is we don't actually talk about what we expect, we assume. We ex- assume the other person should know what we're expecting. So I think the follow-up point to that is this. I cannot expect what I do not express. I can never, I can never fulfill an expectation if I don't know what the expectation is. My wife can never fulfill an expectation if she doesn't know what it is that we're looking for together. And so we have to ask God for the expectations, but also each other communicate about the expectation. My kids don't know what to expect if I don't give them what I'm expecting of them. Uh, they don't know what to do if I don't tell them. This is what I, it would be like saying, hey, figure out the rules. In my house, there would be none. I have to expect, here's what I expect from you, and here's why I expect it. My wife and I have to have these conversations. What are the expectations? We cannot expect what we are not willing to express. If you're not willing to express it, you're assuming that they're going to get it. And as unromantic as that sounds, Like, I like to think that I'm able just to look at my wife and be like, I know what she needs right now. Excuse me for a moment. She wants me to come over and make out with her for a moment. (laughs) Were you thinking that? Am I right? Rejection, failure, see? Shame. (laughs) No, she's not thinking that right now. See, I can't figure it out. She's probably thinking, Dave, you better not share another embarrassing story again. (laughs) I had her permission to share that story about her honeymoon. But she probably thinking, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Am I right that time? A little bit. <laughs> I have to express it. I can't assume it. I have to speak this. It was funny. I remember um, going to Mexico one time, and uh, I was, we, were, we were in these homes, and kind of a, a hostel, and it was kind of like a hotel, but it was a place where guests would stay. And it was a mission trip. And they had a shower. It was supposed to be hot water. And they had the uh, knob that said H and C. And so I turned it to H every single day, and it was cold. And I'm thinking, all right, there must not be hot showers. Well, everybody else was coming out saying, man, isn't it great that the water's hot? I mean, we're in Mexico, and the water's hot. I'm like, how are you? Hot water? I'm getting cold showers. I mean, for like three days in a row. They were coming out saying, man, that was. And I thought they were joking. Like, they were playing this trick on me. Like, yeah, we got these hot showers. It's so great. And, and then I, would, I walked in the bathroom after this guy used the bathroom, and it was, you know, had this steam all over. I'm like, how is he getting hot showers? I'm having frigid, cold showers. And by the end of the week, it hit me that H in Spanish is helado, which means cold, and C is caliente, which means hot. cannot expect what we do not express. Um, Express. Now listen, you might not agree with the expectations, but at least if you express it, you can talk about the disagreement. Listen, if you expect your spouse to do something, you never tell them, hey, I really need you to do this. This is really going to help me. Then you can't complain if they don't do it. Now, if they disagree with you, at least it builds a conversation piece to say, is this what God expects? See, that's where we go, is then we come back to the Lord. We're able to come to the common ground so that we may live in harmony. That's the word here, that we may live with the same mind. I can tell you that now in my marriage, I've understood that my expectations can be lived in because I've learned to be of the same mind with my wife. And so I understand there's a flowing element of expectations and experience, but it's healthy. Secondly, notice what he says here. He says, finally, all of you having the same mind, sympathy. By the way, this is where we get our word sympathy. It's the same word in Greek and English. It's sympathias. And English, it's kind of easy to remember, sympathy. And it literally means, has this idea of putting yourself in the other person's shoes, to feel like the other people. It is the heartfelt, overwhelming experience of somebody else. It means I'm willing to experience what they experience with them. That's the word sympathy here. So I have to ask the question. I have to put, I have to put myself in the shoes of the one I'm expecting something from. So 
Let's take, for example, my wife. I would love every day to have a five-course meal. I love that. Wouldn't that be great? Guys, all right? Like you start with an appetizer, lead to the salad, dinner, two desserts, five-course meal. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's my, that's my plan. Now, that could become, and I, I'm being silly, but that could be an expectation, right? An expectation that I have. So I go to my wife and say, honey, I want to communicate because I realize I cannot expect what I cannot express. So I want to express to you, I really feel as if I w- it would be better for me, it would help me out my day out if I could have a five-course meal every night. I hear the woman going, slap you in the face. I mean, that's what, right? Well, well th- what this text tells me, if, 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 I'm, if I'm having sympathy, I put myself in her shoes. So the question is, am, what I, is what I'm asking for, is what I'm expecting realistic? Is what I'm expecting realistic? Because if I'm having sympathy, I'm going to put my, myself in her shoes and realize that my wife takes care of four boys, five counting me, that we have a never-ending load of laundry that continually goes, I mean, our washing machine stays on at all times almost. Um, our dryer is constantly going. Clothes have to be changed out. Uh, that there is a you know, house, she's teaching the boys. It's miraculous that I get chicken nuggets and fries. <laughs> like if I'm being honest with you, the fact that she could do anything like that is pretty phenomenal after all that she does. What I, what, I, what I have to do is put myself in her shoes and to go to her and say, hey, I really think a five-course meal would really help me out. Babe, I work all day. I work hard. Now, now, you know the reaction. I don't know how I can't speak for her, but I imagine she would look at me and she would hold herself back. But she would just want to go, what? You know, she wouldn't do that because she's godly. But, and she loves me. But she would look at me with this, this with ridiculous look. You know, guys, you know what I'm talking about where your wife just looks at you and you'd be like, that was dumb, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but if I put myself in her shoes, there would be no way I would ask for a five-course meal. I'm, and I'm thrilled and thankful every time we have a meal on our table because I realize how much work it took to make and get all done that she gets done. It's amazing to me. And that's what happens when we put ourselves in the other person. We're, we're sympathizing with them. We're putting their shoes on. That's the idea here. I'm going to feel what they feel. I'm going to get what they're going through. That way my expectations will match the experience. I understand what I'm expecting. Notice what he says next. Um, By the way, I I love these next two phrases. Brotherly love. Before I go any further, I don't want anybody to think I'm so vain that I want a five-course meal. I'm being silly, okay? Um, Okay, I would like a five-course meal. (laughs) But I'm not expecting a five-course meal ever. But I do like to eat. So it says, brotherly love, a tender heart. Now, what's interesting in the Greek here, these two, these two words are put together in one. This is a compound word. And it has the idea the word Philadelphia, brotherly love, is connected to this other word. And that word is the word splagna. Let's just say that together because I think it's the coolest, one of the coolest Greek words. Let's say it together. Splagna. Splagna is, yeah, you got you to spit on the person in front of you. Splagna. Yeah, there you go. This word in the Greek, this word in the Greek means love that leads to tenderness. But literally in the Greek, the word splagna is the seat of the emotion to a Greek-minded person. It is the seat of the emotion. In fact, the word is literally bowels. Which is meant to be kind of funny because they made the word, right? When they language, the word sounds like what it is. Splagna! Right? That's the word there. It's the moving of the bowels. That's the word here connected to love. So the idea is this. Here's the, the, the point, the question. He says here, listen. Are you being tender in your bowels? Bowels are meant to move. And they should move tenderly because if they don't, you have a stomach ache. Am I right? So he's saying here, listen, the love should overflow. (laughs) This is the word. I'm just giving you the word here. I mean, 
I think it's hilarious, but it's so true. It's, I mean, guys, try this when you go home this afternoon. Go, go up to your wife if you're married. If, if, you know, if you're not, you can save this. This, is, this will work. Go up to your wife and be like, baby, I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> we, we talk about accepting Jesus in our hearts. Their seat of emotion was bowels, and that's exactly what they were saying. It is the word bowels, splachna. And so you go up to your wife. <laughs> Some of you, I can see you doing now. You're gonna, this week you're going to be like, Hey, Splagna, I love you. I love you, Splagna. Um, that's the word here. The idea is it's tender, it's moving, it's, it's not being, it's not stopping, it's constantly moving, and, and it's, it's constantly producing so that we are healthy, and that's the picture of that. That's why it's a seat of the emotion. It is a very tender spot. It's a very tender place, and uh, not very romantic, but very tender. Um, and, and so the idea that when my, when my expectations are not met, is my response Philadelphia connected with Splagna? Is my response a lovingly tenderness? A, a loving tenderness that says, it's all right. It's okay. And that's the question. Am I being tender in my approach to unmet expectations? Is my focus on undeserved grace over unmet needs? Is my focus on what God has done over what I'm getting. See, this changes everything when we view it this way that says, you know, I, I'm, going, I'm going to have a tenderness toward the expectations. I'm going to have a tenderness toward these things that sometimes are difficult to, to the, the expectations that are difficult to keep. I'm going to have a tenderness in my reaction. I'm not going to be angry and shameful and anxious and overwhelmed and uh, even a bit sad. I'm, I'm going to allow tenderness to take over. I'm going to allow Christ's love, Christ's leading in my life because I realize we are all in this journey. I realize my wife is on a journey and that I'm on a journey and that takes patience and that takes tenderness to help her in that journey. You, 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 look, at your, you look at your situation, you say, listen, I was expecting A, B, and C to be done and, and, and I, I did A, B, and C and I was expecting X, Y, Z. How do you react, right? Your expectations don't meet with the experience, the experience contradicts the expectation that you had, how do you respond? Well, the scripture tells us in tenderness. I respond in tenderness, realizing that we're all works in progress. I respond in tenderness. Now, uh, th- by the way, this is, this is pretty interesting because I think this happens quite often outside even of family life. Um, I, I, with my kids' Little League teams, I do some announcing. It's kind of fun. I get to get up there and I announce and, and announce the names of the kids, batting and things. And uh, I was I announced the other the other week um, for one of the All Star games. And when you have All Star games, they always have a district district one little league representative who sits in the press box with you. And it's kind of intimidating because they have all these people that sit there, and you know you can't make a mistake. Make sure you get the strikes and balls right. And and so I'm up there and I'm announcing and I'm listening to this conversation because I'm nosy. It was happening over here and I was listening to it. Um, I'm just being honest. I wanted to know what they were saying. And they were talking about this softball game. It was a nine and ten year old girls softball at Halfway Park. And they were telling the story about how they had to eject two coaches during a 9 and 10 year old softball game. Where the story got even juicier was that these two coaches, the one guy was sharing with this other guy, and I was listening, he said they were pastors. And the guy was talking about how he thought of all the people that should not be thrown, ejected from baseball games, softball, girls softball, nine and ten year olds, should certainly not be pastors. Um, by the way, very interesting. The, the guy that was with him looked over at me and goes, Well, actually, uh, that guy over there is a pastor. And I looked at him, he looked at me, and he goes, Listen, I'm not, am I going to have to throw you out of here as well? And I went, No, man, that's, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. You know, what, how do you respond? Like, the expectations now just change over what a pastor is because of something that happened. In other words, we even respond outside of our family, outside in work environment, in, in school environment. It is tenderness. Is it tenderness? Is it, I'm going to respond in a way that God would respond to me. Think about this for a moment, and we're going to see this in a moment. Isn't that what you and I should respond with? Is, isn't this the way God responded to me? I mean, remember Genesis chapter 3? God had an expectation that we were going to be a picture of his image, and we sin. Now, granted, we had consequences of that sin, but how did God respond? In loving kindness. In saying, remember the first thing that God did after, after 
Adam and Eve made themselves known to God. Remember what God did? God covered them, didn't he? He covered them. He had an animal killed and put clothes on them to cover their shame. The first sacrifice was the covering of God for people. Think about that for a moment. So when my wife doesn't meet an expectation or I don't meet her expectation, how do I respond? My reaction should be with tenderness because I understand the grace of God. I understand what God has done in my life. And notice he goes on, a tender heart, and then he says a humble mind. The word here, humble, is different than any other word you find in the New Testament for the word humble. It's not the normal word, humble. Um, it, it's a word that matches these other words. It's tapamophros. Um, and it literally has this idea of a deep sense of one's littleness. You know what that means is, when I talk about expectations, I realize how little my expectations really matter. Now, not that I don't have them, but in the scheme of things, what matters is God. What matters is His glory. What matters is His name. So when I think about my wife, what really matters is not me. I'm small in this game. I'm, I'm, I'm just very insignificant in the work of God in her life. My part is just to point to Him. And so he says the way we do this is with humility. By the way, this is talked about all through 1 Peter. If you turn over just a page, 1 Peter chapter 5, he says this is the way it looks. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Why? So that at the proper time he may exalt you. Go back to 1 Peter 3. He says, listen, have a humble mind, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for this word you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. You're here this morning and your expectations are high for your marriage, your expectations are high for your kids, your expectations are high for your family, and it seems like your experience does not match your expectations. He says here, listen, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and let Him deal with the situation. Let him deal with it. And, and let him bless. Let him exalt. Let him work. I, you know, really, the point is, don't, don't let what you expect stop you from seeing and experiencing what God wants to give and do. Don't, don't let what you expect stop what God is, is, is get, bringing in that experience. You're here, maybe you're here this morning, and I know, I know there are some of you, you you're, you're giving and giving and giving, you're, you're having low expectations, you're trying to live right, and, and maybe your spouse isn't giving, isn't doing, isn't fulfilling their role. Do you trust God to exalt you in due time? I, I love what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, and I want us to hear these words in family. I want us to hear these words in our relationships. He, said this, he says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? He says, listen, it, it, to love someone to get something back is easy. For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that for you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. If I always did and got back exactly what I did, wouldn't life be a lot better? It's not the experience, though, is it? The experience of life says I do and give and sometimes don't get back. Notice what Jesus says. It's pretty powerful. Hum humbling ourselves. Hu humility. Here it is. But love your enemies. And Jesus went right to the, the core, which is sometimes even the people we're talking about aren't enemies, but they're like enemies. Even our enemies, this is how we should respond. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Notice what happens. And your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Notice what He says here. He says, listen, even if my expectations are met, I humble myself under the mighty hand of God. Why? Because I know that He blesses that faithfulness. He blesses that faithfulness. 
And he brings balance to my life where my experience with him, while my expectations seem to be high, my experiences seem to be low, with God, with the Lord, focus on him, what happens? He brings balance because now what I'm experiencing is something spiritual even though my expectation is physical. What was happening in me is God's working. Um, you know, I, if I'm being honest with you, I've probably, for, for many, many, uh, many years of my, my life in marriage, I always thought, I looked at my family as kind of like the, uh, the proof of my relationship with Christ. Like, so I tried to do all these things, proving who I was and proving what I did and and then I realized, it kind of changed for me, and I realized that really the reason I'm married and the reason I have kids isn't just to prove something. Um, it's actually to teach me something. Do, do you know what I mean? It's not that I'm doing it to say, oh, look how great I'm doing it. They're actually there to teach me, um, to teach me what it means to follow Christ, to teach me to humble myself under Him, to teach me to grab on to Him, to teach me uh, to, to have an ex have my experience match my expectations. And, and it, you know, it's not always going to happen, but that I find my experience in him to be sweet. It brings me back to that experience that I want with him at all times. And so my family is there to teach me, really teaching me how to love, how to care, how to have a tender heart. It's not just where I do it, it's how I do it. They're teaching me how. They're teaching me how to do these things. God is using them in my life to guide me and instruct me. And You know, when I believe, begin to look at my family that way, that's blessing. That I'm able to view God differently because of what they're, God's teaching me through them. When we look at our families like that, then there is blessing. Then there is blessing in our lives. Let's stand together as we pray this morning.